please pause the video and take a moment to read this important safety message. All right, super excited about this video series here today at Blue Glow Electronics. You know, we get quite a bit of interesting and even, um, you know, high-end gear across our bench from time to time here. But none of it falls into the category of, of what we're making this video about today. This is a pair of H.H. Scott 210F monoblock amplifiers, and you just don't see them. You know, I would use the official collector's term, scarce. Um, I've never seen a set in my life. Um, I've talked to a lot of people since I've, you know, kind of been aware of these. They haven't either. And um, there are some posts online and a little bit of info, but not much. I mean, there's even the info online is fairly scarce. So leads me to believe these were, you know, probably an expensive model and thus didn't sell a lot, um, went to extremely wealthy individuals, and there's just not that many of them out there. And these things are in absolute pristine condition, really not a scratch on them to speak of. So, um, one interesting fact about them is in the middle, um, you may have seen the little uh, Model 135 kind of stereo master control. So this was at a point in time in Hi-Fi where, you know, you mono was still the prevalent thing out there. Stereo was starting to come about, but there really weren't integrated stereo units readily available. And so what companies were doing were putting these little boxes in between like this that would kind of uh, mux together the signal from both units and give you a master volume and whatnot and turn it into basically then a stereo setup for you. So if this has interest to you, stay tuned. We're gonna have a lot of fun with this one and I am super excited about it. So I'm gonna make this a three part series. Part one here will be about these units, a little bit of the history about them and a little bit of the uh, lineage about these units themselves. In part two, we're going to get them on the bench, open them up, look at our restoration approach, get our parts list built, and get our parts ordered. And then in part three, we'll finally come back once the parts arrive, and we will install them, complete the restoration, and bitch test these units. All right, let's dive into part one. Okay, this is the earliest appearance of this unit I've been able to find anywhere online. And this is a 1958 Radio Shack catalog, page number six. As you can see here down at the bottom, we've got the Scott 210F Dinoral Laboratory Amplifier. And, uh, you know, competing with it here was uh, the Scott 99D 22 watt amplifier, um, as well as the Scott 240 40 watt amplifier. And then uh, you had the Scott 121C preamplifier. Those are all mono amplifiers, if you notice that at this point in time. There's nothing stereo on this page. Let's take a closer look at the actual article here. Okay, just a few things to note about this advertisement. One, it shows it here with a cabinet of some sort, and these units don't have a cabinet. Um, so apparently that may have been an optional item you could buy additionally. If you'll notice at the bottom, it listed as the 210F chassis. So I'm assuming on a different page or somewhere you would have ordered maybe a cabinet to put it in. Um, the net price here was $189.95. So that's almost twice as much as the, over twice as much as the 99D that was on here as well. Um, I thought it, it was interesting here. You know, you could also buy this for $19 down and $13 a month. So uh, buy now, pay later was even a thing back in 1958 here. A few other things here, you know, it does mention this whole dynamic noise suppressor, um, you know, for continuous adjustment for both low frequency rumble and high frequency hiss. Um, that's the dinoral part of this. Um, something else quite interesting here, it talks about the um, NARTB, which is the National Association of Radio and Television Broadcasters tape preamp for playing direct from tape recorder heads without an external amp. So this could this can uh, this can take signals straight off of tape heads. I thought that was quite interesting. And then if you look down here at the bottom, this is the earliest I have ever seen. You know, I can't say I've looked everywhere, but the earliest instance I've seen for TV inputs on an amplifier. So um, even back then. You could have bought a TV, and uh, not many of them had RCA outs on them for their audio back then. 
but maybe some of them did and you could plug that into this and uh maybe this was early early surround sound um in uh <laughs> in mono there as we are okay so um it talks about the flat frequency response for 19 cps so back in the day they didn't say hertz right that was cycles per second cps's um same as 19 hertz all the way up to 35,000 cycles per second or 35,000 kilohertz harmonic distortion less than 0.5 percent first order differential tone intermodulation less than 0.25 percent and that's where you would play two different tones into this unit and then see how those two different tones playing into this unit affected each other on the output okay so in other words you fed in a uh, a bass response and a high frequency response and when a big bass note hits you know how does that affect your um your high frequency signal there or, or vice versa um talks about long-term power output for the lab so this was you know this is a laboratory amplifier um, of sorts and uh, the application is 30 watts continuous so that's what they're basically saying they're saying uh, full duty cycle leave this on all the time playing all the time it would it would play at 30 watts with no issues designed for 105 to 125 volt output and the tube complement here is two 6ca7s otherwise known as el34s one 5u 5u4g rectifier one 6al5 two 12au7s and four 12ax7s uh, the dimensions on this 15 and a quarter by four and three fourths by 12 and a half and the shipping weight on these were 28 pounds okay up next this is a flyer from scott from 1959 or a little pamphlet and if you'll notice this was all about their stereo monophonic high fidelity components back in the day and they go into talking a little bit about what is high fidelity uh, they talk about what does high fidelity cost um, you can spend as little as two hundred dollars or over one thousand dollars boy those times have changed goes on to talk about how stereo works it's actually a pretty good interesting little article here but then i thought it was interesting they cover the 135 unit here so that, that we we're going to show the uh, restoration of this although there's not a lot to them because they're a passive component but basically what it's telling you here is it's compatible with these types of units including the 210 and interestingly it doesn't show the f on here it shows the d and the e but it is compatible with the f and you could basically use it with any it basically says any system with separate preamplifiers and power amplifiers um, so it's not limited to scott so basically what this is is a unit to bring together um you know and give you a master volume and whatnot for um master on off switch for two mono units to be able to play uh, give you stereo controls over them basically um, and then it shows here the 99d we had talked about um, and it talks about using with the 135 stereo adapter um, then you got the 209 here which is another mono, mono block 36 watt unit but then finally you get here to the 210f and it talks a little more about this and it, it goes specifically into saying how these units are, are designed to focus on getting rid of hiss in, um, in your records, basically. Okay. Then it shows a little bit of the 121C. But I thought it was interesting because this is fast forward one year to 1959. And all of a sudden, what do you see here? The famous 299. Okay. Where, where we introduce stereo into the you know into one integrated unit here and then they have the 330 tuner that is so famous as well and then the 130 um so yeah and then it went back to the and then boy you never see these the 250s i wish i had a pair of these the uh, 40 watt amplifiers here but anyway i just thought it was interesting to see a little bit of the history here on these and how the 210 came in at this point in time here where we're you know mono is still prevalent and maybe even mainstream and stereo is is kind of uh you know coming into play at this point in time all right i thought i'd just show you a few pictures i did find online there's not a lot out there but here in this example it has a metal cabinet okay and it has the little vented slots on the top which don't match any of the pictures we've seen to date um, but you know i think those were 
This cabinet's likely from some transistorized units, but somebody found out it would actually fit on this unit, Scott unit, and they put it on there. Likewise, here you can also see um, another example where it actually had a wooden cabinet and not a metal cabinet. And then, you know, I got a picture here where it shows a metal cabinet surrounding this. So, um, you know, I think several different variations and uh, vintages of Scott cabinets will fit on these, which, you know, is a good thing if the owner of these wanted to get a set of uh, Scott cabinets or get a set made, it'd be fairly easy to do so. And one piece of good news, there is actually a Sam's Photo Fact um, folder for these. So um, folder number, um, set 443 from 1958, folder number 11 um, has the Scott Model 210F. And I, I purchased this download just a few minutes ago. A nice picture of the amplifier here. Um, I always love the photo facts because they show you where every component is at in these units, okay? And then they, uh, you know, they show you a, a schematic and they also give you a nice little breakdown of where you can read resistance between various pinpoints. They show you voltages throughout um, the unit here. And what that does is it really helps, you know, troubleshooting if you're trying to uh, work on one of these. So if you can ever find a Sam's Photo Effect unit for anything you're working on, it's a, it's a great thing to have. One thing I would say about Sam's Photo Facts, though, just a little caution to the wind, they, they did crank these things out fairly fast, and I have seen some errors in them over the years. But in general, I would rather have them than not. And there again, it shows you more component layouts throughout this unit. And then it gives you a complete parts breakdown list. So, um, you know, you can go look up C22 and find out exactly what, what that was. So um, very handy-dandy tool to have if you're... Uh, Make, doing a restoration like this. So if any of you have ever watched Antique Roadshow, you would know or resonate with the fact that kind of the history behind something, all the artifacts around it, a little bit of the history goes a long ways in, in you know, the desirability of something. You know, if uh, it's just you see interesting stories on there that have the backdrop of how these things came to be. And I think it just adds so much to the overall process. Even this restoration I'm doing, I feel like this history adds value to it. So if you don't, you can cut the video off at this point and jump to part two. Otherwise, stick with me for another couple minutes here. So I don't know if you guys remember, I restored a year or two back a set of um, Dynaco Mark III's and we ended up painting the Transformers kind of a brown color. I thought they turned out absolutely beautiful. At any rate, the individual that I did that for, um, you know, maybe a year or six months to a year after he got those units back, he, he reached out to me. So this this uh, video has been a, a year and a half, two years in the making. As a matter of fact, these units have been sitting in my basement in boxes uh, for close to a year now. Um, and I'm just now getting around to them. But anyway, onward to the story of these amps. And he says, laugh out loud. I looked across the amps via a post on one of many of the vintage audio groups on Facebook. The guy had just posted a set of JBL Hartfields that he had inherited, and folks were going nuts over them. The, the guy clearly had no idea what he had, and he was looking for guidance in selling them. People were throwing out huge numbers for these things, $25,000, $50,000. I checked where the poster lived, and it turns out he was only a few minutes from me. By the way, this is in the uh, Detroit area, for those that might be curious. I PM'd him that I may be interested in the speakers, and that I would like to check them out, and that even if I don't buy them, I could probably steer him in the right direction as far as selling them. My hope was that even if I couldn't swing the Hartsfelds, maybe there was other gear there that I could have. Okay, The owner turned out to be a super nice guy. He inherited the gear from his uncle, a bachelor, a machinist, and a World War II veteran of refined taste whom he clearly idolized. In addition to the Hartsfeld, he inherited a 1963 Corvette, a monster German lathe, and his uncle's stereo system. Powering the Hartsfelds were the 210Fs with a Rico cut turntable and an early reel-to-reel -reel unit. 
I was able to buy the audio gear, and a friend and I auditioned the Hartsfelds. Since he was unsure of the functional quality of the Scott amps, I brought over my trusted Dynaco ST35 and played Beck's morning phase through the JBLs via my phone. These were beautiful sounding speakers with strikingly deep and authoritative bass that blended seamlessly into a wonderfully open and natural sounding mid-range. Even haphazardly set up in his basement, I could tell they threw a luscious soundstage. Only glaring fault were they were shy on the top end, and whether that was because of the 60-year-old caps or the two-way design, I could not be sure. But having recently acquired Clips Horns just two months before, I knew the Hartsfelds were not in game for me. The JBL drivers were spectacular and obviously superior to what comes on a K-Horn, but I knew I could not do the things I had planned for the K-Horns to these JPLs. A side note, this individual has done some significant upgrades to his K-Horns, and they sound amazing. Um, it would be like putting vinyl siding on the Sistine Chapel. I'm lucky to have a very supportive wife, but four speakers of this size would not work in our house. So the owner offered the speakers to him at a very fair price, understanding that he would not flip them. He, he was offering them at less than market price because he basically wanted to be able to come over and hear them himself, okay? Individual then said, knowing that I could not keep the promise to type so much money in the speakers and they, they would likely need some additional spent expense put into them to get them, you know, working correctly, plus having to store them since he didn't have room for them. He regretfully declined and packed up the Scots, the Reco Cut, and the Reel to Reel. We took some pictures of the JBLs and I showed him US Audio Mart. The speakers sold a couple weeks later for nearly twice what he offered them to me for and were promptly shipped out of the country as most of the original Hartfields have been. It's with a tinge of regret that I recount this story knowing I'll likely never have that opportunity again. I hope the Hartsfelds found a good home. I'm still in contact with the seller and once you are done returning the amps to their original glory, I'm going to have him over and play him some jets <laughs> with his uncle's amp. Earlier he was saying his uncle had a, a record of a jet flying over that he knew through these would sound like the jets were just tearing his living room apart. I'm sure it will put a smile to both of our faces. So, at any rate, me and the individual went back and forth um, for a while, and um, you know, I ended up taking these on for restoration. They've sat here for quite a while now, waiting to be restored. And so, we're going to get these uh, units um, on the bench now, and let's get this restoration underway and bring these things back to their glory that they were in 1958.